If there's one statement in the Bible that causes some people to react negatively, it's this one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you make that statement publicly today, rest assured there will be those who respond quite <laughs> negatively to that. They will say, well, that's offensive to me. And uh, they will respond in a very negative way as a result. In a recent television program called Spirit Connection, co-host um, Marty Tyndall asked four panelists the question, is Jesus the only way to God? And throughout the program, support for Christ as the only way to God was often interpreted as being exclusive and thus inappropriate. For example, Lois Wilson, the former moderator of the United Church of Canada, said, and I quote, I think it is utter nonsense to say that Christianity is the only way to God. Um, they had a divinity student by the name of Nabucco Kwai, I I I from Saskatoon who said, I believe that Jesus is Christ, but not necessarily that Christ is Jesus. I cannot say that Jesus is the only way. Now, I'm not sure I understand what he means by that first part of that statement. It still doesn't make any sense to me. But regardless of saying you get the drift of what he was saying, I cannot say that Jesus is the only way. And co-host for the Spirit Connection, Ken uh, Gallagher, uh, Gallagher puts it this way. He said, and I quote, the passage John 14, 6, has been the root of the church's poor treatment of Muslims, Jews, and native people. And then he makes a question, very provocative, says, and I quote, is it time to pack it away? Because, notice the word he uses, it is dangerous. Well, the statement, when Jesus talked about being the only way, was made when he had the last supper with his disciples. And it was at that supper where Jesus had made the announcement he was about to to die. In John 13, verse 33, he said, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, essentially, what Jesus was saying is, I'm going to die. You, not yet. You're going to be around a while longer. Your deaths are down the road. Mine is imminent within 24 hours. Now, the text in our passage, John 14, says that when they heard this, the disciples were saddened by it. It caused them to be greatly upset. Indeed, the loss of their master and their hope and dreams uh, bothered them very, very greatly. And that's why Jesus makes that next statement when he says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. And the reason for that was because he said he was going back to heaven where he had come from, and there in heaven he was going to prepare a place for them to take them someday. Let not your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Well, this place that Jesus went to prepare, we call it heaven. And it's the future destiny of all the children of God. Well, in our text that we're looking at this morning, in verses 4 and 5, the conversation continues between Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus says to them, you know the way to the place where I am going. Well, one of the disciples, Thomas, responded by saying, Lord... We don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And it is then, in verse 6, which is my text this morning, Jesus clarified what he meant about the way to the Father's house. And this is what he said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so this morning, we are going to look at this passage of Scripture. And uh, before we do... Let's bow in prayer together. Father in heaven, we thank you that Jesus indeed, we believe, is the way. The way to God, the way to heaven, the way to eternal life. And that's what we proclaim here at New Life Church in Tula, Manitoba. That 
that Jesus is the only way, and apart from him, there is no other salvation, no other name given under heaven among men whereby we may be saved. Amen. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the six this morning who showed their faith in Christ by taking the step of obedience to be baptized. Mm -hmm. And I praise you for that. We want to see many, many more come into the kingdom of God and be in heaven someday with us where we celebrate around the throne of God. But in the meantime, we want to serve you. We live in a world that's hostile to these kind of beliefs. Help us to know how to respond in the midst of all that. And I stand against all the forces of darkness. I command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. Holy Spirit, I welcome you here. Guide and lead us into the truth that we need to understand. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory. For we pray this in Christ's name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, from the city got lost out in the countryside, and he saw farmers uh, on his tractor out in the field, and he stopped them, and he went up to him, and he said, uh, hey, mister, he said, I'm lost. Can you tell me the best way to Brandon? And the farmer responded, said, no, ain't never been there. And uh, he said, well, then uh, how about to the way to Portage? No, he said, never had the need to go there either. Um, the fellow said, really? Well, how about to the McGregor? That's supposed to be on the way to Brandon. And he said, no, I have no idea about that either. Well, finally, the city slicker says to the farmer, for goodness sakes, here's a guy who's lived in Manitoba all of his life, and you sure don't know much. And the farmer responds and says, maybe so, but I ain't lost neither. <laughs> well, that's the reality concerning Jesus. He ain't lost. He knows the way. When it comes to giving directions to God in heaven, Jesus can, and Jesus does. Now, in our text, the first phrase of John chapter 14, verse 6, and Jesus said, I am the way. And then he goes on to say at the conclusion of that statement, no one comes to the Father except through me. And so he's announcing that Jesus is essentially saying he is the only way to God and to heaven. Now, um, a lot of people, when they hear this kind of a claim, feel that it is... <coughs> narrow-minded it's exclusionary and they don't like it and uh, many people uh, become very unhappy maybe that's your case this morning maybe you're hearing this and it's just grating against you in a terrible way you just don't like this idea this exclusivity that uh, pastor Henry seems to be promoting in this church and um, a lot of people react negatively to that uh, in his book, God's Loving Word, Pastor Ray Stedman tells how one time uh, he was leading a Bible study of folks uh, going through the uh, book of John. And he came to John chapter 14, our text, and he said he read the scripture, um, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And he said immediately, one of the ladies in the Bible study group looked at him and said, that's terribly narrow-minded. Well, the thinking this lady had in... Um, Stedman's Bible study is representative of many people today because people today believe there is no one single way to God. Um, rather, they would suggest there's any number of ways that will get you there. Some time ago, I was having a conversation with someone and we got talking about the truthfulness of the claims of Christ and I referred to the statement that Jesus made that he said, I'm the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father but by me. And uh, this uh, lady said to me, I don't believe that Jesus is the only way to God. And he, she went on to say, I, I believe that you can get to God in many different ways. She went on to give me an illustration. She said, you know, it's like a wagon wheel that has many spokes. And on the outside are the various religious beliefs. And every spoke leads to the center hub. And she used uh, that as an illustration, the idea that... In the center, you have God, and then all around the circumference, you have the various religious systems of the world, Shintoism, Zoroastrianism, Taoism, Islam, Hinduism, Baha'ism, Buddhism, and, of course, Christianity. And so her point was is that no matter what you believe, eventually, you'll get there. And this belief is, is uh, many people hold it, it's, it's like all the rivers in the world flow into the ocean, and so in the same way all the religions lead to the same divine reality. 
Oprah Winfrey made the statement in one of her programs where she said one of the biggest mistakes we can make is to believe there is only one way. There are many diverse paths leading to God. And so when people say that all religions are equally valid ways to God, equally valid paths to God or to some ultimate divine reality, and no one single religion has the ultimate truth, the final word on truth, the question then that I have and I pose to myself is how should I, how should we as Christians understand this? Um, should we be teaching that Jesus is the only way to God? Should I be giving a message like this this morning? Should I be saying what I am saying? No. Should I be saying that and questioning the idea, is Jesus the only way to God? Or are we guilty of being exclusivistic, intolerant, narrow-minded, to use some of the terminology of today's day and age? Or is this something maybe we as a church should abandon because we don't want to be offensive? I don't want to offend people, and maybe if I stop saying Jesus is the only way, I'll gather their, gain their acceptance of me. Lee Strobel in his book says, when I was an atheist, I bristled at the assertions that Christians made that they held a monopoly on the only correct approach to religion. Who do they think they are, I grubs? Who are they to judge everyone else? Where's the love of Jesus in this? And Strobel, of course, had to work that through before he came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Well, here's the question I ask. Should we be telling people any way leads you to God? I'm going to say to you this morning, should I say this to you? No. Well, any way you want to go, you can get there. No. Yet, it's interesting to notice Jesus Christ stated the, the, clearly the very opposite. And his warnings on this were very, very specific. Notice how Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 7 when he said this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And he, Jesus describes the two polar opposite positions you can go to life or to death, to heaven or hell, and he says the vast majority of people are on that broad way, heading that way, whereas a minority, a small group of people, are on the narrow path. Well, my response to uh, all of this is I ask those questions, what should we be doing? Should New Life Church change what we've been saying? Should I be stop giving messages like this and not preaching this anymore? My response is that absolutely not, because we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are obligated to say what he says. Amen. In other words, I can't change what Jesus said. What authority do I, or the moderator of the United Church of Canada, Lowe's Wilson, or anybody else have to say Jesus was wrong? Right. Right. Well, what, what, what basis do I have that authority? I've had conversations with people and they, they com complain to me about this position that I hold and reacting negatively to me. And I respond to them. I say, you know what, really, in reality, your argument about Jesus being the only way isn't with me. It's really with <laughs> Jesus right. himself. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I'm the only way. I'm saying Jesus is the only way. Right. Okay? I'm not saying New Life Church in Stonewall is the only church, but I'm saying every church that preaches like this can get you to God as well. All right? Uh, we are not setting up a cult here. Uh, we are establishing the basic <laughs> fundamental truthfulness of Christianity itself. And the result is, and here's my position, that every person ultimately has to decide, this is the key question you have to think through in your life, and that is, is Jesus who he said he was? That's what you have to deal with. You have to answer that in your mind and in your heart and in your life. So, that's the decision. You have to make what about you? Who do you think Jesus is? Is he who he said he was? Was he the Son of God? Now, if he was, then it makes implications in death. You got a problem. Do things like be baptized, live a life honoring to God, and serving Him. And of course, that's why people react against Jesus because they don't want any of the implications of that decision. The next statement Jesus makes in the text 
and says, besides, he says, I am the way, he goes on to say, I am the truth. And he announces that he is the truth. Now, he says this a number of times throughout the, the scriptures. For example, in John chapter 8, verse 31 through 32, he says, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And he's talking about himself being the truth. Now, because of that statement, of course, people react quite negatively. And the response a lot of people will make is that they don't like <clears throat> the statement that Jesus makes because it's what we would call an exclusive truth claim. Now, you hear that phrase uh, when you read uh, in, in the literature on this stuff, and people react against what they call exclusive truth claims. So uh, to define an exclusive truth claim is you would have two people, and the one person would say, my position on this particular topic is the right one. You are wrong. And the other person would say the opposite. It's an exclusive truth claim in the opposite direction. No, I am right, and you are wrong. And so there you have competing <coughs> truth claims that are exclusive of each other. And so when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, he is making an exclusive truth claim. And what people who hear this react negatively and like the statement made by the man on that TV program calling it dangerous is because they see it as the potential of leading towards conflict. And very frequently they will point to things like the crusade and how people killed in the name of Jesus. The um, uh, co-host of that program, Ken Gallinger, said that it has led to the treatment, bad treatment of, of, uh, of First Nations people, of um, uh, Muslims, and many other people in the world because of the exclusivity of that statement. Mark Chan says in response, some argue that social harmony can only be achieved and maintained if religionists desist from making exclusive truth claims. And so we are then told that the goal should be rather to avoid these exclusive truth claims, and rather we should be inclusionary, and we should accept equally all other beliefs and value systems and not only accept them, we should go the next step of affirming them, as you have, for example, today, by the LGBTQ position, is that I not only accept their position, but that I affirm it, that yes, I agree with them, and that we need to uh, be tolerant of other people's belief. And essentially, their true goal is this, that everyone's right, nobody's wrong, so nobody gets their feelings hurt by feeling excluded. I'm no longer on the outside, I'm on the inside, I'm accepted, and so you don't hurt my feelings anymore. Now, let me say this, that all truth claims, by virtually sim simply being truth claims, end up being exclusionary. Right. Let me uh, read you a quote from Ravi Zacharias' book, Can a Man Live Without God? He says this, and I quote, the moment that you say that Jesus cannot be the only way, you have become as exclusivistic as I have been. Yeah. The moment you try to refute what I am saying, you are implying I am wrong and you are right. By so doing, you are applying the law of non-contradiction. Now, the law of non-contradiction, if you've taken logic, you know it says all A equals not A. Does not equal not A. So that's the idea that Two things cannot be true at the same time. One has to be yeah. right, one has to be wrong. Right. Um, uh, either water is wet uh, or it's dry. You can't be both. Right. Right. It's one or the other. One is true, one is not true. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, Aristotle said, and I can, uh, he said, I can prove the law of non-contradiction to you. All you have to do is open your mouth and say something. <laughs> <laughs> now, they say that when we claim Jesus is the only way, that he's the truth, that we are guilty of feeling superior and we feel better than everybody else. And of course, that leads to our intolerance. And they dislike that sense of intolerance that we seem to communicate to them. However, I want to respond. I want you to notice the inherent contradiction of those 
who accuse us of intolerance. I've already alluded to this, but notice that uh, if you say that uh, <coughs> Jesus is the truth and all other religions are false, uh, people will respond by saying you're wrong, that you're intolerant. So now I want to ask you the question of these two guys up above on the screen. Which one here is being intolerant? <coughs> Which one is intolerant? <coughs> The answer is they both are. The Christian who says the original intolerant thing, and also the person who objects to it as being intolerant. Right? Because this guy here has rejected him and saying, you're wrong. Now he himself is as intolerant as this guy is. Why? Because he's not tolerating this guy's position. He himself is intolerant. I like this meme I came across. You say you want tolerance and despise hate, but if I don't agree with everything you say, you call it intolerance and hate. Explain to me again how that works. It's true. Think through it. And so when people accuse Christians of being uh, intolerant by saying Jesus is the only way, they also are as intolerant. That's because she, this woman that are on this uh, slide, is intolerant of our intolerance. A uh, bumper sticker went like this, are you intolerant of intolerance? And my response to anybody who would have that as their bumper sticker says that if you are intolerant of intolerance, then you are no longer tolerant yourself. You're just as intolerant as I am. Think it through, that's exactly the way it is. It's the law of non-contradiction, it has to be. So, the issue here, I want you to notice that this is the root issue behind all this. I want you to understand, here's what's happening. It's not an issue of intolerance, but rather, it's the issue is which belief should be tolerated and which belief should not be. See? That's really the reality here. Ultimately, all other beliefs are tolerated except Interestingly, Christians. Yeah. That's the way it works. You know, this could be really humorous if you went up to somebody who says to me that he's tired of my intolerance. Well, I could respond to say, well, I'm tired of your intolerance of my intolerance. <laughs> <laughs> and then he could say, well, your intolerance of my intolerance of your intolerance. <laughs> and then I could say, I'm really tired of your intolerance of my intolerance of your intolerance. And the question I have is, where would it end? <laughs> you just could go on and add infinitum. Now, I want you to know that in the final analysis, all reality in the universe itself is based on exclusivistic principles. That's how life on this universe operates. Psalm 96, verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns, the world is firmly established, it cannot be moved. Now what he's saying there is you have the laws that operate this universe, so, uh, in this universe we live in. You have the first law of thermodynamics. You have the second law of thermodynamics, especially, it, 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 all of them ex, extremely exclusivistic. Uh, for example, um, the law of gravity is terribly intolerant. When I fell off that ladder and broke my collarbone, I've told the story here before, in the church, I found the law of gravity terribly exclusionary, terribly intolerant, because it acted out even though I didn't want it to be acting out. Why? It's because the way the universe operates. We live in a universe that is exclusivistic. One of my sons, uh, when he was attending university, uh, said to me, Dad, you know, uh, at university, they're teaching us that all truth is relative and there are no absolutes. Wow. And uh, he said, you know, how, how would you respond to that, Dad? And I said, well, you know, uh, you, you can respond by saying this. The statement that they make when they say there are no absolutes, that is actually an absolute statement itself. Yeah. The moment you say there is no, you are making an absolute statement. Yeah. Hmm. Now... I said to him, you know what, here's the way it works, I'll tell you what, they apply it to philosophical discussions, but they never apply that approach to real life. Um, for example, I said, let, let's say, it, <coughs> excuse me, as an illustration, you're going into medicine. Now, you would not go as a doctor into an operating room saying, you know, everything's relative. 
So uh, it really doesn't matter if the surgical equipment has been only sterilized in lukewarm water. <laughs> That's a very exclusivistic statement. All equipment has to be sterilized. You wouldn't go for an operation where the doctor said, well, it's a relative university. Let's see, this time I won't sterilize my equipment. And you wouldn't let him operate on you. Not at all. Back to the story of Ray Stedman's Bible study when that lady said to him this that's uh, terribly narrow-minded. He said, yes, it is, but that's the way truth is. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And he went on to give an interesting illustration, and I've included it in my sermon here today. He said, you know, I find the phone company to be terribly narrow-minded, too. If you want to call someone up, you must dial the exact numbers <laughs> in the exact order given. They will not allow any deviation. And he said, if your number is off by just one digit, you'll reach the wrong number. You've all had people give, they call you and you have the wrong number. And then he asked her, he said, does that mean the phone company is narrow-minded? <laughs> <laughs> he said, the woman was not able to refute my conclusion, but neither did she accept it. Her statements ended in a shrug. And that's a sad, the typical response of so many people. Well, the third of the statements Jesus makes is he said, I am the life. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And the reason that Jesus is the way to the Father is because he is the light. Yeah. We come to the Father through Jesus because Jesus gave his life for us by dying on the cross. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, between us and God, a great separation exists, and it's due to our sin, and it dooms us to an eternity of separation from God. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in Titus 3 verse 5, it says he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. It's my sin that blocks my access to God the Father. And I can't come to God on my own because I have sin in my life prohibiting that reality from happening. And so we have this gap between us that good works, religion, philosophy, morality, anything that you attempt does not work. And the reason we got good works or religion or philosophy or morality do not work which are the fundamental tenets of all the uh, major right. religions of the world, right. yeah. is that if you perform in a particular way, you will have access to God. We call it good works. You've got to perform, do certain things. But Jesus, by his death for us, bridges that gap by dying on the cross for our sins. Jesus is therefore thus the only one able to truly deal with my sin, and then take it away. And so he thus qualifies to be the true and correct way to the Father. All others fall as means of getting to the Father. In other words, the other spokes on the wheel don't end up at the center hub because none of them address the issue of my sin right. that separates me from God. And the only way my sin that separates me from God is dealt with is by the shed blood of Jesus Amen. who comes from Amen. Amen. The only way. Amen. You need that answer. If you don't have that answer, it, it doesn't work. Yet to all who received him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And you see, that's essentially what everybody in the world has to decide. Am I going to accept Jesus' offer of forgiveness of sins? Your choice. And those who disagree risk, according to Jesus, hearing his ultimate words of exclusion, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That's very exclusionary. Mm -hmm. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Terrible, terrible, exclusionary, terrible words. But it's true. So let me wrap it up by asking this question. Are we contributing to violence in the world? Is my sermon going to create violence in, in the world? But when I say that Jesus is the only way, is, is, is that true? What Ken Gallinger says, that I, it's dangerous, I'm, I'm creating violence. Is that the case? 
Um, or uh, are we being guilty of being arrogant and smug? I'm better than you. Nah, 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 nah. King of the castle. Uh, are we saying that we're the superior ones? You uh, uh, peons down here, it's just us Christians who really matter, who really count. And the answer to that is obviously not at all. And here's why. First of all, true Christian love never forces people to believe. Revelation 22, 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take of the free gift of the water of life. Whosoever will, free will. You choose to accept it. And so we attempt to lovingly present the gospel and the truth and to persuade people to believe in Jesus. We use the persuasion. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Paul writes, we persuade men. We don't step on their chest and pound them and hammer them and say, you got to believe in Jesus. We don't do that. We always respect people's ultimate rights to disagree and disbelieve. As Joshua said to the people of Israel, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves right. this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods of the forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites and whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua is saying, you can do what you want. It's up to you. And I'm saying the same thing to you. Okay. I've made my choice. These six people over here, and the Ian will baptize them, and Emily who helped with the uh, towels, they made their choice. And we urge you to do that. Secondly, we would never condone violence in the name of Christ. Matter of fact, Paul says in Timothy, the Lord's servant must not even quarrel. Right. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. <laughs> and those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. You don't hammer people over the heads. You don't say, you've got to believe. You don't yell at them. You don't scream at them. You come across winsomely openly, lovingly. And finally, and thirdly, we never ultimately judge people because that doesn't belong to me. I'm not the judge of where you will spend eternity. That's God's job. Mm -hmm. or is surely we will all stand before God's judgment seat, not Henry's. Did you notice that? Doesn't, my name's not in there. <coughs> no, it's not. I, I, I say God's judgment seat. It is written as surely as I live, says Henry, it says the Lord. Every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. You're not accountable to me. You can reject what I've just said. I'll still love you. I'll still accept you. Doesn't make any difference to me. I want you to believe, but if you don't, God bless you. That's your choice. I, I, uh, I, I worry about you on judgment day, but it's your final decision. As a matter of fact, we actually weep when we see others reject the offer of Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3, For as I have told you often before, and I'll say again, even with tears, many of his enemies of the cross of Christ. How sad it is when people say no. Christ, what? We're saddened. But on the other hand, we greatly rejoice when we see them turn to Christ. Woohoo! Party God. Party time. Six people made a commitment. Amen. We were baptized. Woo! <laughs>
and we just want people to turn to him because we honestly believe he is the only way to the Father because he is the only one who died on the cross for our sins. We thank you for that. And this morning, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you are in the service this morning and you've never made that decision concerning Jesus Christ, you've never asked him to come into your heart and life, would you do that right now? Mm-hmm. Will you open the door of your heart? I'll, I'll explain to you how you can do it. Very easy. All you have to do is, first of all, admit you have sinned. And you can say the prayer quietly in your heart. Dear Lord, I admit I've sinned. I admit I've fallen short of your expectation. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I receive you into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for coming into my life. Now, if you pray that prayer and sincerely meant it, Jesus came into your heart. Tell me about it as you leave the service this morning. If you're watching online, leave it in the comments or send me an email. I'd love to hear about that. Father, bless this message. Make it make a difference for your kingdom because that's ultimately the most important thing in the world anyways. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said?